Chapter 25 Alexa Brenner Everyone has already taken their place around the room and at the table. I sit in the open spot beside Miles. Taking the cover off my plate, I find the same breakfast as yesterday. No one says much while we eat. Looking up and across the table, I catch Kelly's glare directed right at me. Redirecting my gaze back to my food, I try to think of what I could have done to get her angry at me. Thinking back to the last few moments all I can gather is that I sat next to Miles. No matter how it happened I've gained the jealousy of a vampire girlfriend. The only things I can think of is don't do anything else that might make her jealousy turn to rage and that in today's training she's going to kill me. I would swear by it. Too soon breakfast is over and everyone in boot camp is called to the basement. I kiss Raylene on her lips before I follow everyone downstairs. Kelly already has people splitting off into the pairs and locations we were in yesterday. Run on the spot, knees hitting your hands. Kelly sounds like a drill sergeant while she calls out the commands. Pain stabs through my calves with each hop. Any energy I may have gained from sleep and food is gone almost immediately. My legs quickly stop going as high and soon I can no longer reach my hands despite lowering them a lot. Kelly looks disgusted as she looks at me. Everyone gather into a circle and sit down. Alexa join me in the center. I bite my tongue to keep from saying every swear word I know. Suddenly, I feel like the victim of a schoolyard fight. Everyone circling the two people going to fight, knowing full well which one is going to win and who is going to be beaten to a pulp. Knowing that no matter what happens not one person will come to save me. Everyone gets settled in the spots. My heartbeat increases with each moment. Watching Kelly's movements carefully, I try to figure out what she's going to do. Her hand comes up and quickly swipes against my cheek, then goes back to her side. Something feels like it is running down my cheek. Without thinking I reach up to wipe my cheek of the irritant, but my hand comes back a thin slice of red. A cut that wasn't there a moment to go. Touching my cheek again, my finger comes back wet with red. Kelly takes in a deep breath. Her eyes turn darker, a trick of the lighting perhaps. She gives no explanation to the questioning and horrified looks she receives. The obvious show of her power and speed frightens everyone in the room, terrifying me as she directs this and her rage at me. Let's see what you learned yesterday. Kelly slows her speed a bit. I have trouble dodging but I do manage to miss a few swings. Kelly slows her speed a little. I have some troubles dodging but manage a couple. I see an opening to swing a punch of my own. She grabs my arm, twisting it around my back. Pushing me away from her, I stumble through a couple of people and outside the circle. Determined to not back down I get back in the circle and throw a few more punches. Kelly backs up a couple of steps so I try a roundhouse kick. For just a moment none of my limbs are touching the ground. My back hits the floor and my breath escapes my lungs. Weapons Gio comes through the hole in the wall with two clanking bundles. He sets them both on the floor. Breath regained, I stand up. Gio filters through the weapons and finds two. He walks to me and hands me a sword and dagger. The sword has one straight edge and one serrated edge. The handle is wrapped in red leather and the guard is fashioned from the top to the bottom of the handle in a darker metal than the rest of the sword. The dagger has the same red leather on its handle. The blade is straight-edged. Thank you. I express my gratitude for the weapons, but Gio just turns his back to go get another weapon. Nothing more than watching some movies tell me how to hold either weapon. The sword in my right hand rests with the guard against my wrist. I hold the dagger in a stabbing style. Gio returns with a double-sided axe for Kelly. She takes it in hand, disgust written on her face. Gio, what the hell is this? It's an axe. He stares at her with one eye, raising his unibrow. I told you I wanted double swords. Why would you make me an axe? 
I can hear her anger growing worse and worse as the moments go on. Your left arm control is nowhere near where it should be for double weapons. A two-handed axe is a versatile weapon for someone like you. With your strength you can utilize it as a one-handed weapon. Geo states. Why would you ask what I wanted if you were just going to make me something else? Kelly practically growls out the sentence. Her fists clench. I'm told it's polite. This weapon suits you better. Gio ignores Kelly and starts to give out everyone's weapons. There are a couple more complaints about not getting what they asked for, but nothing is outspoken as Kelly's comments. I take the time to get more familiar with the sword. The weight of it feels odd in my hand and strains the muscles in my arm. I cannot imagine having to battle for any period of time longer than a minute. Swinging the larger blade in a couple of controlled movements, I start feeling better about the possibility of wielding a weapon, yet I know nothing about how to. Beyond my concentration of making sure the blade does not hit anything, I can see Kelly trying to melt holes through my skull. Everyone is trying to get a handle on their new weaponry. Geo made a vast number of different types of weapons, most of them I couldn't begin to place a name to. Something large and heavy crashes to the floor. Glass shatters next before anyone moves. Kelly is gone before I can gather both my blades. I hold them in each hand. All with the speed to do so are gone upstairs and out of sight when the first human reaches the bottom of the stairs. The mini stampede upstairs causes my own movements to be carried slightly faster as the crowd pulls me along. Everyone breaks off at the top of the stairs, some go left and others right. To the left is the kitchen untouched compared to my right. The doorknob is buried in the wall and glass from the living room window is shattered all over the floor. I see the open door and the fights happening outside, as the others see what's happening they immediately run to the action. The rest guard the living room window. I'm left at the top of the stairs with not a clue as to what I should be doing. I'm not eager to fight unless I have to. Soft scraping upstairs warrants an excuse to go upstairs to investigate. I bet that Raylene had run up there. Thinking this is a good exemption to the rule of the use of the staircase beside me, I walk up the servant's stairs. I hear the scraping again, slightly louder this time. Rounding the top of the stairs I pinpoint the direction of the sound. I see the closet door partially open. I open the door the rest of the way. Scanning it from top to bottom, I spot a foot on the bottom shelf. Stay here, be quiet, and pull in your foot. Raylene's foot disappears from my view. I shut the door and turn back around to go downstairs. A tiny thud hits the floor above my head. Stepping down to the base of the stairs, I round the corner to the left. My intent to go into the living room is sidetracked at the crossroad center between going outside into the living room or back upstairs. Looking outside I can see Taylor is slowly picking herself up from the grassy ground. My body feels as though it is encased by concrete, I'm frozen still. Sandra walks from out of my view. She helps Taylor up the rest of the way by grabbing onto the back of her shirt. Grabbing either side of her head Sandra says something into her left ear causing Taylor to twist her face in terror. Tears of blood flow freely from her right eye as a patch of red grows on her left shoulder. Taylor's movement drops as she tries desperately to scream her pain to the world. The crashes bangs and cracking stop at this moment. Someone shoves me into the door. My body freezes once again in this new spot. A couple more demons run past me. All the attacking demons are soon on the front lawn. As Sandra takes her hands off of Taylor two things happen at once, Taylor collapses to the ground and the attacking demons take Sandra and retreat. Stumbling back as people from our side rush out the door to tend to Taylor, I turn. My steps falter as I access the damage to the house and to many of the people that live in it. A couple of bodies litter the living room, some I recognize and others I don't. Furniture is turned over and smashed while walls have dents and holes in them. 
My hands release, and only once the two weapons I was holding reach the floor, do I actually remember I was holding them. Purpose suddenly drives me as I remember the other thing I had forgotten. Raylene is upstairs. Gaining more confidence in my steps as I climb up the stairs I am almost at a steady speed by the time I reach the joint landing between the three staircases. The closet door is open and pumps the energy into my muscles to run the rest of the way up. I throw the door the rest of the way open and start throwing the towels on the first shelf out as I hope that she was able to conceal herself better than the last time I saw her, though I know she couldn't be in there. A towel hits the top of my head and sits there. Behind me, Raylene stands amid scattered towels. Relief floods through me as she looks perfectly unharmed. I jump to hug her. Not willing to let her go for the moment, I hoist her up onto my hip. Looking into her eyes, I see a dead quality to them. She must have been terrified thinking that she may be next. Any progress we made in restoring her innocence from whatever happened at the airport was reversed. We say nothing because I can't find anything to say. I carry her downstairs to find out what we can do from here. The extent of the damage is overwhelming as James puts a quiet voice to his mental list. 16 dead, 11 with varying degrees of injuries needing medical attention, irreparable damage to the veil, the house is in shambles, but necessary all of it. What do you mean necessary? I ask as we reach the last stair. He turns as he speaks and keeps his voice low so no one else hears. It was a test, a preliminary attack. They attack us, bring down our numbers, weaken us, and show what they can do without even trying. They were testing to see if we were a real threat or not. He finishes this conversation by leaving. We tidy the house after the attack. I feel like hours pass after setting Raylene down. Room in hand, I squat down to scoop the pile of glass into the dustpan, and Raylene empties the pan into the silver garbage can. Coming in for another round, I ask her to keep pulling back the pan an inch, so we can pick up the smaller shards. Satisfied, I look up and nod to her to signal she can dump the remaining glass in the garbage. As I stand up, I can feel the prickles in my legs from squatting for too long. Looking around for an idea of what we should do next I check things off in my head. Miles and James are taking planks of wood from the walls and floor in the living room to board up the broken window. Daniel is finishing up putting the door back into its proper place. It had been torn off the hinges. Gio fixed the broken hinge and has been making nails. Ashlyn has a group bandaging up the wounded. Raylene and I have swept up the debris. What is this doing here? Gio rounds the corner with my two blades held out. He marches to me in a huff. I am, I ah, uh, ah, uh, the rage in his voice and I surprises me. I, um, uh, nothing. There should be no reason you ever dump your weapons. You are not worthy of them. I should have never given these to you. I should have safeguarded them myself. You're not a fighter or a survivor and you will never be one. The Cyclops' rage causes his voice to raise with each sentence. Geo, that's enough. Miles raises his voice over the Cyclops as he walks into the room and catches the tail end of what Geo is saying. Whatever she did she's sorry and I'm sure she got the point to never do it again, but that does not give you the right to strike her down with words. Whatever your feelings are, you will keep them to yourself. Geo, Nanuff, James says strongly. Geo shoves the weapons in my arms, drops the nails and stomps off in a huff, mumbling something under his breath. Tears threaten to fall, swelling my vision as doubts fill my mind. Doubts of my capability to protect Raylene and me. Doubts I can fight. Doubts of my position with this group. Nothing but doubts. My stomach is sickened with the words Gio said and the resulting feeling of inadequacy. Looking at Raylene's straight face only furthers my thoughts. Miles puts a hand on my shoulder but I shrug it off, not wanting the contact right now. Don't listen to Gio. He hates humans. Miles' explanation does nothing to affect how I am handling Gio's words. 
How about you and Raylene start setting up for supper? Set enough places for anyone who can come upstairs for dinner. Ashlyn should be able to tell you the number of the injured that are able. I nod, not trusting my voice at the moment to not crack. I'm happy about the distraction. Walking on my way to the kitchen I stop at the top of the stairs. Turning I find Raylene following close behind me. How about you go and ask Ashlyn how many we should expect for supper? She says a quiet yes before hightailing it down the stairs. Continuing to the kitchen, I open the cabinet. I grab enough bowls to fill the table and the same number of spoons. Raylene meets me in the dining room once I have half the table set. Nine are coming for supper. Kelly is staying to watch everyone, but I'm supposed to ask James to get her something to drink. Raylene tells me what I'm sure is exactly what Ashlyn advised her to. Thank you, why don't you go tell James that Kelly needs something to drink? I turn her around in the direction James is in. Okay. She runs off to go tell James. I set the rest of the place settings by the time she comes back again, this time with everyone following eager for food. James stays behind in the kitchen, getting the food together. Through the window I see each can opening, soup contents flying out, passing over the stove and floating into the dining area to land in each person's bowl. Mine arrives and pours into my bowl piping hot. The scent of clam chowder reaches my nose. Taking up my spoon I take a bit out and start cooling it like many others are. When James settles down to his own spot he gets right to talking, a meeting over supper. Fifteen people. At lunch we had thirty-eight. What happened? He gives us only a moment to think it over, but the question was rhetorical either way. Darius organized a test attack. To do just this, bring down our numbers, weaken us and our defenses. We have to work harder to regroup. One thing I know for sure is that we can't stay here. James continues. We need to gather up all the supplies to move them. We'll start this tomorrow morning. It shouldn't take too long if we all help. Chances are we will be attacked again within a few days if we don't leave quickly. Where are we supposed to go? Daniel asks. James thinks for a moment. The West Ed Mall. A few people in the room announce their liking to this idea. We should go a few at a time, maybe even use different routes to get there. So, we don't attract too much attention. They already know Kelly and me, so one of us goes with a few runners first and prepares them for our arrival. I'll go first. Kelly stands in the doorway. I can have two people ready to leave by early morning. We'll take the tree to get close, then book it the rest of the way. We'll need two more people. You. She points to Nia. And you. She points to a male. Be ready to leave at two. She turns around and walks back to the basement. I guess that's decided. We'll prep some bags for you to take to exchange for hospitality. James picks up his bowl and takes it with him into the kitchen. I hear a door open, rustling and a click of the door closing. James comes back moments later with reusable bags in hand. He assigns a bag to each of us with what we should fill them with. Then takes two and departs. Finishing up my supper, I take my bowl in one hand and grab out two bags in the other. Leaving my bowl in the sink one double back to check on Raylene's progress. She still has a way to go before she will be finished supper, so I go to the pantry. I stuff each bag with equal amounts of soup cans, pasta packages, and cans of fruit. By the time I'm finished some others are starting to take their bags to fill them. I go back to the table to find Raylene two meters away from where I left her. Her bowl is mostly empty at the table. I gauge how much she ate and figure that she ate enough. She's smiling while Crystal walks over her lap trying to follow her hand, seeking the little girl's hand pushing for more pets. I don't want to ruin the moment but I have to. It's good to see her smiling again. I drop off the bags at the table. Kneeling beside her I put my hand out to start petting Crystal. 
She ignores my touch and continues to rub herself against Raylene. People drop off their bags at the table, then go to their respective sleeping quarters. The rooms quickly clear as almost everyone heads to bed from an exhausting day. A moment to stop and breathe tells me that this maybe isn't such a bad idea. Raylene looks as though she could fall asleep right where she's sitting. Miles beats me to pick her up. When her head hits his shoulder and her eyes close, I know she's not going to make it upstairs. He was smooth, so he doesn't disturb her. I follow them to my bedroom. Going around him I flip the covers back so he can settle her on the bed. Pulling the blanket over her I check her for any signs of waking. Thank you, I whisper to him. A nagging thought on my mind slips into words without me realizing it. What was up with Kelly this morning? It was just a misunderstanding. This morning, when I woke up, she was already in a mood. She's just been a little. I cut Miles off. Bitchy? He can't hide his smile behind his disapproving eyebrow raise. On edge lately. On edge? She tried to kill me. I point to my cheek. She'll get over it. You'll see. He leaves. Stopping briefly at the door frame to turn around he tells me, have a good sleep.